Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnana Salakaya Chakshurum Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Namaha Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinami Namaste Shara Chati Deve Gauravani Pichari Yenavi Sesa Sanyavadi Pichati So Today we're going to talk about something very interesting and very valuable, which is how to awaken a desire to do something that you don't want to do. How to feel positive about doing something you may not feel positive about doing. Because if you feel positive about doing something, you'll do it. And you'll be energized. And if you feel negative about doing it, even though you know it's the right thing, it's hard to do, and you may not be steady at it. So if we can learn how to take everything that we're supposed to do and make it positive, that'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? Like I, you know, for example, I say three in the morning, and some of you shiver. Oh, three in the morning, it's too, so early. And I say three in the morning and somebody else says, wow, best time of day. You know, positive connotation, negative connotation. So naturally, the person who has the positive connotation is going to find it easier to get up than the person who has the negative connotation, even if they both understand equally that it's important. Or even if they both equally want to get up. The person who feels it has a better chance of doing it. You agree? And we tend to do more what we feel like doing. It's easier to do what you feel like than what you should do. Correct? Because what you should do, it's in your head. What you actually feel like doing is in your heart. And we're guided by feelings. So we have to make what we're supposed to do, what we should do, what we want to do, a feeling. And then we'll do it. Otherwise, we're kind of at odds with ourselves. I know I should but I don't feel like it. So we're conflicted. So that's very common. So uh, at first, the first thing I want to do is I want to relate that to the modes of nature so we can see what, how the different modes affect us in the regards of feeling. So in the, in the mode of ignorance, mode of ignorance is inactive. So basically the mode of ignorance, it, it doesn't really matter how you feel or what you think, you're in an, a state of inertia, so you're not going to do anything. Even if you say, yeah, that sounds good, but you won't do it. Because it's, you're, you're, you don't have the energy to do it. It's, it's too much trouble. So the mode of ignorance usually is, you know, that sounds good, or, you know, we should do that. But then you have a million reasons not to do it because it, and all the reasons are just it's too much trouble. The mode of ignorance, it's inactive. So you can never be aligned when you're in the mode of ignorance because no matter, how, no matter how much you know you should do it, it doesn't activate you to do it because you're not in the mode of ignorance. It's not action. It's lethargy. It's laziness. It's procrastination. Yeah, oh yeah maybe we'll do it some other time. Not now. That's the mode of ignorance. So, yeah, well, let's talk about it later. Yeah, okay, I'll think about it. What about this? Yeah, I'll think about it. This is the mode of ignorance. As Prabhupada said the mode of ignorance doesn't go beyond thinking. So generally when someone says, I'll think about it, what does that mean? Generally it means, yeah, it's just, it's a polite way of saying, I don't feel like doing it. And it sounds like too much trouble. So nothing happens in the mode of ignorance. When you get to the mode of passion, things happen. So, relatively speaking, passion is better than ignorance because at least you do something. You get something done. But now what's interesting about the mode of passion, and it's something we can put into practice. What's interesting about the mode of passion, you'll do it if you feel like it. But if you don't feel like it, you won't do it. So that's, that's why you, you'll see people in the mode of passion, sometimes they're very active, they're very determined, it looks like they have all these good qualities, you know, high achievers, 
focus, determination, intention, goal setting. But that's only because they found something that they want to do. And then they're inspired. If you take that same person and you say, well, you know, the goals you set, they're not dharmic. You should do this. If, if they don't feel like doing it, they don't have any energy to do it. The only energy comes from a passion to do it. It's kind of a, a natural psychology. Naturally, you're passionate about what you like. But the difference between that and the mode of goodness, in the mode of goodness, you'll be passionate about something because it's right. That's what gets your blood boiling. Not necessarily that you like it, but it's the right thing to do. So, so for example, you might be looking at some options, and one option looks very attractive according to your modes of nature, and so you're inspired to do it. But a person in the mode of goodness will only be inspired if it's the right thing. So if it's the wrong thing, even if he likes to do it, it doesn't inspire him. Whereas a dharmic person, someone in Satva Gun, he gets inspired because it's right, not because he likes it. You understand? It's like, it's like kind of like a love for truth. If it's right, I love it. If it's true, I love it. And if it's beautiful, but it's not true, or it's in the mode of passion, or it's not right, even though I love it, I don't love it. it doesn't, I can't get inspired about it because it's not right. <clears throat> or in the mode of passion, <coughs> passion, being right is not so important, but it's what you like. You understand? So, sattva guna is, is dharmic, and mode of passion is selfish, and a mode of ignorance is, it's just lazy, it's not, it's not even anything. So, so then, how could we use this idea? Because there's not that many people who love truth so much that just because it's true, they'll do it. They'll, they'll, they'll get excited. Well, maybe they'll do it, but to get excited about it because it's true, that's like special, isn't it? You know, like sometimes someone will come to the temple and then you'll talk to them about Krishna consciousness and then right then they'll say, this is what I want to do. It's, it's true and they're so excited about truth, they surrender to it. That's a rare person, isn't it? It's, just, oh, it's true and because it's true, I do it. That's what excites me. Is it the right thing? If it's the right thing, then I do it. But most people are, do I like it? Then I do it. Right? And that also goes with Varnashram. It's, it's your nature. You have a nature, you get inspired by it. So it's not that it's entirely wrong. If you link up your nature and Krishna consciousness, it'll work. But if we can take something that we're supposed to do, that we don't like to do, and we can link up all the positives to it, and all the negatives of not doing it, then what we maybe didn't like doing, now it starts to look attractive. Like, I like doing it. Because I see all the positives, and when I add all the positives, I become inspired. For example, maybe you don't like green vegetables. Maybe you like white flour, fried food, sweets, white rice, and potatoes. Which if you, I hope you don't like it, because if you do, you'll become a diabetic pretty soon. But let's say you like that. And then I put out, I invite you over for lunch, and I put out all the green spinach and the green salad, and then there's a cucumber, lemon drink, and you're looking at this and you're going, where's the bread and butter? Where's the cheese? Where's the white rice? Where are the potatoes? Where's the sour cream? He said, no, we don't eat that. I said, you're not inspired. <laughs> you're losing your appetite. You're not inspired. So, then I, so I sit you down and I say, okay, now, one of the main causes of diabetes is everything you like to eat. And I convince you that if you keep eating that way, by the age of 50, I guarantee you'll have diabetes. And once you have diabetes, your whole body starts breaking down and you're susceptible to heart attack, etc., etc. And I'm so expert that I convince you of that to such a degree that when you look at white flour, sugar, white rice, and potatoes, you have no attraction to eat it. It scares you. And then I tell you about all the glories of green juices and green vegetables and brown rice and organic this and fresh that and, you know, purely made homemade ghee from deshi cows and how 
these other cows will kill you, and this and that. And all of a sudden, you're looking at the green salad and the green vegetables, and they're starting to look good. Because I've changed your attitude. So what is good now becomes good to you. And what is bad becomes bad to you. Whereas before, what was bad looked good, and what was good looked bad. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what we're trying to do as, as sadhakas. Now, now, just look at, look at Prabhupada's books. What does Prabhupada talk about in his books? All the good things about Krishna consciousness and all the bad things about the material world. True? Isn't that one of the major themes? Like, like even if it's not a theme specifically, but that's the experience you get from reading the books. Krishna consciousness is good, I should do it. Material life is not good, I should renounce, I should detach, I should simplify, I should balance. I should at least balance material and spiritual. Isn't it? That, that's, that's the impression you get from reading Prabhupada's books. Krishna also says it. So, so what's happening? Let, let's take an example from the male perspective. Now in the Bhagavatam, it says a lot of things about the physical form of a woman. It says a lot of things in terms of the physical form is a trap for the man. And it's very, oftentimes it's very blunt. Sometimes it's very blunt about the nature of a woman. It, it's warning a man that although you see it as an object of enjoyment, it can actually entangle you in the material world. <coughs> so it balances your vision. Because if you only see it um, as positive, then you won't see the possible neg neg negative aspects of it. And then the negative may look good. And you won't, un you won't understand where the dangers are, you won't understand how to balance it out, you won't understand how to make proper relationships with the opposite sex, how to deal with them respectfully and so forth. So you see that in the Bhagavatam. There's a lot of things in the Bhagavatam basically says, danger, be careful. You think this is going to make you happy, it won't. And it's just many, many, many things it talks about, right? Then the other side, it talks about the glories of austerity. Austerity is the wealth of the Brahmins. Right? That's a very positive statement about something that could be seen as very negative, right? Getting up, taking a cold shower, chanting Hare Krishna early in the morning. For the average materialist, doesn't sound fun. That sound like fun? You get up and it's black outside, it's cold. You're going to go into a cold bathroom and take a bath and get dressed and chant a mantra for two hours. Average materialist, it doesn't sound fun. And then Prabhupada says, austerity is the wealth of the Brahmin. So what is Prabhupada doing? Positive associations with something which material, generally, material, from our materialistic perspective, doesn't sound positive. And everything about Krishna consciousness, every sacrifice we have to make, Prabhupada frames it in some positive context. So for example, Prabhupada told the devotees, don't force anybody to move into the temple. Just teach them about Krishna consciousness. When they see the value, then of their own accord, they'll want to do the austerity, because the austerity will become attractive. So what Prabhupada's doing in his books, he's trying to make austerity attractive. <coughs> what is normally not attractive, he's associating something positive with. So that's a framework for what I want to talk about now and how we can do the same thing. So if you, if you look at your life and any, anything that you're having trouble with, generally there's a good chance you have something negative associated with it. <coughs> Could be a fear of doing it, a feeling of inadequacy, a fear of failure, or just a feeling of uncomfort. I don't feel comfortable doing that. Would you like to do this service? No, I don't feel comfortable. I feel it would be too difficult. I don't know if I could do it. It'd be too. Would you like to be president of this temple? Oh, too much, too much anxiety. You know, there, or anything that you don't like to do, immediately you feel uncomfortable just talking about it. So there's negative associations to everything we don't want to do. And if you think of everything you want to do, naturally, it's positive associations. How about this positive association to ice cream? I actually have a negative association because I know how bad it is for you. 
And I could create a negative association if you allow me, but you won't, I, you'll probably never come back to my classes if I do. So, um, I actually saw a demonstration of a person who, um, he wanted to overcome, he ate, he was actually addicted to pizza, and he wanted to overcome eating pizza. So the facilitator had him, had him associate negative things with pizza, like cholesterol and overweight and this and that. Anyway, he got him to the point where actually the person couldn't eat pizza anymore. It was just, just by looking at it in a certain way, when he'd see pizza, he actually would lose his appetite. So, in a sense, that's what Prabhupada's doing in his books. He's trying to get us to lose our appetite for the things that we like materially and create an appetite for the things that are good for us that we don't like. Isn't it? Right. So, we can extend that process. It, like, like in my Japa workshop, that's one of the main things I do is create positive associations with Japa. And help people overcome any negative association. You know, because some people have negative associations with japa because of negative experiences. I don't chant well, I don't like it, it's boring, I fall asleep, it's difficult. So multiply that by 20, 30 years, you'll have a lot of negative associations. So in order to help the devotees, I have to interrupt that pattern by talking about all the fantastic, amazing things that come from good japa and how much you're missing if you chant bad japa. And so the whole workshop is basically feeding into this idea of the holy name being Krishna's mercy, Krishna's affection, Krishna's love, our greatest opportunity, the most important, powerful process. And then getting people to kind of switch their attitude. And, and when they switch their attitude, amazing things happen. They start to associate positive things with japa and then even though their japa may not be better, their attitude's better and their experience is better. Because that's the way psychology works. If you have a positive attitude towards something, your experience of it is better. Just like so-and-so Maharaj is coming. Ooh, so-and-so Maharaj. We don't know who he is, but he's a Maharaj, right? So that means when he sits down and speaks, it sounds better than when so-and-so Brahmachari speaks, even though they say the same thing, because he's so-and-so Maharaj. So the expectation is that the Maharaj speaks better. And the psychology hears it better. That's just psychology. <clears throat> They've done experiments with this. And people who have <clears throat> opinions that cannot be altered, the only way they can be altered is by hearing from someone they respect. And he can say the same thing that everyone else said, but now it alters their opinion. So by having a positive association with something, all of a sudden it, it becomes better. You, have, you know, Japa is amazing, it's wonderful, it's an opportunity, it's special mercy. <clears throat> We're so fortunate to have it, it's the religion of the age. All these positive associations, then when you chant, it becomes a positive experience. You actually like it. <clears throat> you look forward to it. Just like I spent many years in Mauritius, and maybe some of you are thinking of going there. And I could inspire you to go, or I can inspire you not to go by what I say about it, isn't it? I was thinking of going to Mauritius because, you know, I need warm weather and I heard it's a nice place to preach and I'm taking Vanapras and I want to, you know, create, you know, a couple areas to go to and I've met some Mauritians there inviting me. Mahatma Prabhu, what do you think? I said, yeah, it's an amazing place. People are so open, it's beautiful, beautiful beaches, weather's nice practically all year round. And there's like 4,000 initiated devotees out of a million people. That's amazing. That would mean, <clears throat> if that were New York, that means we would have 4,000 per million. So how many in New York? 20? So we'd have 80,000 initiates. So that's the proportion. You know, like so many, you know. I don't know what 4,000 out of a million is, which is like out of every 100 Every thousand people, there's four that are devotees, something like that. Is it? Maybe. So, yeah, mangoes, papayas that just grow wild, bananas, lychees, lychee season, <clears throat> sweet devotees like that. So now you're inspired. It's like you have all these visions, right? So, yeah, I, I could go there. 
And if I tell you devotees are really nice, really sweet, <clears throat> then when you meet them, that's how you'll experience them. You'll experience everything the way I said it, because I have created positive impressions. Now, I could say, I don't really think you should go there, because people aren't serious, and you could preach, but, you know, they, they'll say yes, 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 but they won't follow. And actually, externally, they look like they're good devotees, but in their private lives, they're really not. And they'll seem like very nice people, but, you know, behind your back, they'll say things. And all of a sudden, you go there, and you meet these really nice devotees, and they're like, I don't trust him. And then you won't like them. <coughs> because of how I primed you. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> I primed you with negatives. So, when we become devotees, we're already primed with positives and negatives, right? 3, 3 a.m. is a negative for most of us. That's the time I used to wake up before I was a devotee. College days. No, 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 excuse me. It's the time I went to bed, excuse me. <laughs> I wake up. I would go to bed at 3 a.m. and I would wake up at 11. So you know, positive connotation is not 3 a.m. It's very negative connotation. So we come because we're in the modes of nature. We come with these positive and negatives, right? And if we, and what will make it easiest for us? To follow vows, to live with an integrity, is that positive connotations or positive anchors to everything that we should do and have negative anchors to everything we should avoid. In a healthy way, not in a, you know, I hate everything and everybody, that attitude, but just healthy negatives for things that we want to avoid and healthy positives for things we want to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now, how do we do that? It's actually a function of intelligence, and it's just an expansion of what Prabhupada's doing in his books. And so now that we're talking about this, when you read Prabhupada's books, I think it'll become more clear to you that that's what's going on. There's all these positives about austerity, about surrender. Like, surrender is lived. How does that word sound? For a lot of people, that word doesn't sound pretty. It sounds like basically like getting your tooth pulled. Sit down and I'll pull your tooth. So, so I'm going to force you to do something. And Prabhupada uses these words. Surrender. Um, sometimes even devotees will use the, word, use the word slave. How does that sound? Become a slave of Krishna. But for the devotee, the pure devotee, that has a very positive connotation. Slavery. To be completely controlled by Krishna's will, a very positive connotation. But for conditioned soul, it's very negative. Right? So, through intelligence, through the function of intelligence, we can create positive connotations towards things which we, which we may have ne negativity towards. So let's, let's use, I like to use the example of rising early, because it's practical, and it's something we all need to do. So let's say you're a person that has difficulty rising early, or you would like to rise earlier than you're rising. Probably, the time that you would like to rise has, a, has in some negative connotations, such as, I can't do it, it's too difficult, I don't feel like it, it'll be hard, I'm, I could never do it, I've never done it, something negative, right? So obviously, if that's how you feel, what are the chances of doing it? Unless you're like some amazingly determined chatriya who can like transcend your feelings, it's going, to be, it's going to be difficult. And even if you can do it, it's just going to be difficult. Right? And the interesting thing is that there's so many things that we want to do in life that we have negatives towards. And then we can't figure out, why is it that I'm trying to do this and I can never do it? Because inside you have so many negatives. You ever notice that? Or it's something to think about. Think about anything you want to do that you're not able to achieve or that's difficult. And it's pretty, pretty likely you have some negatives associated with it. Like, I can't do it. It's too hard. 
I never could do it. I'm not good at it. What if I fail? What if I succeed and then people think I'm special? That'll be difficult to deal with. You know, it could be anything, right? Okay, so now we're... So the function of intelligence is to analyze things. And the function of intelligence is to see the effects of things. So when you start thinking with your intelligence, you're thinking, if I could wake up early, I would have more time to read, and I really like to read. And early morning is by far the best time to read. Nobody's going to bother me. Nobody's going on. Nobody's going to call me. My mind is clear, and it's awake. It's also the best time to, to chant. And if I chant early in the morning, usually I chant better rounds. And the morning is in the mode of goodness. So the more hours I can be awake before sunrise, the more hours of sattva I have in my life. And the more hours of sattva I have in my life, the better. And then you can just start listing all the positives, all, all the benefits. And then you can list all the negatives. Like, well, if I don't get up till 6 o'clock and I have to leave the house at 7.30, it takes me half hour to get ready, and then I have to eat breakfast before I go out, so it basically gives me about 25 minutes to chant my rounds, so I'll get three or four rounds done before I go out. And pretty much the other 13 or 12 are going to be pretty bad rounds. So we start looking at the negatives. And, you know, I'm getting more sleep than I actually need. I'm wasting time. Could be doing so many things, etc., etc. Or maybe there's a project. And if I just had an hour a day in a year, I could, you know, write my book or whatever, finish this or that. And I could do that every morning if I just got up early. So you're looking at all the negatives. You know, my guru, Mars, told me to get up at this time and I don't, so I'm not following his order. Prabhupada said, get up this time, I'm not, I'm not following his order, so now there's all this guilt from not doing it, and etc., etc. So all this negative. So you're looking at all the negative. What's the idea? You want to anchor in negative things about doing the thing you're doing right now, which is getting up late. And you want to anchor in positives about doing what you're not doing because you want to do it. So the idea is, if you just want to rely on your determination to get up, it's not going to last. It's not the way the world works. It's just, just based on your determination. It's unlikely. But if you can associate so many positives that after hearing all the positive things and reminding yourself, when I say 3 a.m., it starts to make you feel good. You say, yeah, 3 a.m., that's like the best part of the day. And 3 a.m. becomes a really positive sound. And 6 a.m., oh, Rising at 6 a.m. becomes appalling. It's just like a horrible thought to think that I would sleep that late and waste those good hours, those three hours in the morning, and I could be up. So, so the idea is for us to figure out how we can anchor in positive emotions so there's positive feelings about doing the thing that is difficult for us. Now, I had this realization, it was very interesting, that I realized that for me and other devotees, a common problem in the Grihastha ashram, or it could be a problem in any ashram, is if you have anchored in negative feelings about the ashram, then it's pretty hard to make a marriage work. Or if, you have neg if you're a sannyas and you have negative feelings about sannyas, maybe after a few years you start to think, this is like artificial and all these sannyasis are really not renounced and Really, in Iskand, there shouldn't be a sannyas ashram and this and that, you know. How are you going to maintain your sannyas ashram? Because you have equated so many negatives with it, right? So you see, sometimes people enter Grihastha life, and one of the things that they say is, oh, it's getting in the way of my spiritual life. So that's a negative. Right? My wife or husband's hard to deal with. That's a negative. My children are taking my time away from my japa. That's a negative. And you go on and on and on. So then you're looking at Grihastha life, as a negative. If that's the foundation, you could read 526 books on marriage and you're, you'll never have a good marriage because you've anchored in a negative. That's just your paradigm for it, right? So, doesn't it make sense if that's whatever ashram you're in, you should associate positives with it? 
Now, the brahmachari can associate negatives with your situation. He can see all the negatives. Oh, you have to work, and I don't. And you, you know, you're always spending your time, you know, watching your kid when you could be chanting japa, this and that. So he can see the negatives, and those negatives would be good for him. But if I see those negatives, especially if I'm not in the vana process level of, of grihastha ashram, that's just going to turn me against, it's going to make me have bad feelings about my wife and children. And then it becomes counterproductive. And then it, it's, it's very difficult to have a good relationship because I always see it as a negative. My wife becomes the um, antichrist. My kids become the antichrist. They're all uh, working against me. Does that make sense? So sometimes that's all the problem is. A person has associated negatives. And if he just associates positives, then he's fine. Everything's good. Sometimes you'll actually find someone who the couple is very compatible, but they don't get along because they've associated negatives with Grihastashram. It's Maya, look at this, you know, have this whole apartment, you know, and I have a brahmachai. You could have 20 brahmachais living in this apartment, now there's just three of us. And, you know, we're spending all this money and, you know, this and that. And it's all negative. And it doesn't work. Then you, you know, you see your husband or spouse kind of like an enemy. So, If you look at something you're having difficulty with, it's likely you have little or no positives towards it. You have, it's just, it, you, you're, when you think about it, your feelings are uncomfortable. And if you think about anything that you're inspired to do, think about how it feels like. It feels good, you look forward to it, you like it. Yes, you agree? So. Now that we're aware of that, then we have to start learning how in our specific situation to create positives about it. And that's where intelligence comes from. And that's what Prabhupada's books are doing. He's creating positives. So you think about any value made. I remember when I, be, when I moved into the temple, when I joined the temple, I had this very positive association with celibacy, and I'll explain why. Because at the time I was going to college and the area I was going to college, it was kind of the height of the, what do they call that? Free love, kind of like the height of the free love movement. So free love kind of met, meant something like, like relationships aren't that important, and long-term relationships are not important. But relationships are more fun. You know, you might meet someone and then that day, afternoon, evening, you just get together and enjoy. And you may never see them again. It's just, so, when I was in school, knowing that that was the environment, it was, for me it was kind of scary because I knew that practically every woman in this school if you just got to know her, she would say, well, well let's have sex. You know, it was just like, you know, what you would do. And I was so disturbed by that, just that atmosphere. It completely was disturbing me. And I felt such a positive emotion becoming a devotee because I knew when I move in the temple, I'll become celibate and I'll give that up. I felt like, a, like I was a conqueror. I conquered that, you know, because that was, that was the thing that was tormenting me. Just like I don't want to be around that environment, that vibration, to be controlled by that. So I look back and I think, how was it that I came from that environment and I could become celibate? And after becoming celibate, I don't remember having any trouble. I don't remember, you know, the next few weeks I was going crazy, you know, looking at a woman, thinking every day I have to leave the temple and go back to my girlfriend. I don't remember thinking like that at all. Because I had so many positive connotations towards celibacy and, and develop so many negative connotations towards illicit sex because I experienced it and it was empty. So that's what helped me. That was the power. And if you don't have that, how can you do it? And if you want to maintain it, how can you do it? If, unless you look at illicit sex as what it is. It's illicit. As bad, it's wrong, it's, it's something we shouldn't do. And celibacy is, is a form of power 
it's, a, it's the highest form of control. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Then you can do it. You relish it. You look forward to it. You like doing it. It's like when, who was it? Was it Orvasi who was trying to allure Arjuna? Was it Orvasi? Does anybody know? Who was And he kept calling her mother. He just was like that wasn't where he was in his consciousness. That he did not see her as a, a girlfriend. He saw her respectfully as a woman. And to see her as a girlfriend was all negative. Right? So if we can see everything sinful, if we can equate negatives with everything sinful and equate positives with everything pious, then naturally you just want to follow. So the four regular principles we should associate positives with. And we should associate negatives with not doing it. And any commitment you make, you can easily make if you associate, po if you associate positives with it. And what happens sometimes when someone can't follow is they have too many positive, positives towards not following and too many negatives towards following. Isn't it? It's like, you know... So, so they're struggling. Now, what I was saying before is that uh, there's a certain person, a certain mentality, that they just love doing what's right. If it's right, they love it. Right? And that's, that's where we should someday come to. Just because it's right, I love it. You know, tell me what to do. I'll do it because I love truth. But until we come to that platform, then we have to create a love for what's right by reminding ourselves all the positives associated with it and all the negatives associated with not doing it. And one of the ways that we do that is not only just associating the positives now, but we associate the future, the results. If I do this for the next five years, what will the result be? And even better, if I don't do it for the next five years, what will the, re what will the result be? The result will be I'll be exactly in the same position I am now. Nothing will change. You know, we can all improve our lives, right? And you ha we have to do something to improve them. And if we, if we don't change what we're doing five years from now, everything will be exactly the same. And so for some of us, if we're not where we want to be, and then we think in five years as everything is the same, I'm going to go crazy because I don't like the way it, where it's at. I might like some things, but there's some things I need to change. So... If you look, about a, you look at a vow that you want to commit to or you have committed to and you think, what are the positive, positive ramifications of doing that? And if I don't maintain it well, what are the negative ramifications and how will that play out in the future? Where will that put me five, ten years from now? And then you see, if that doesn't put you where you want to be, if it puts you in a really bad place, it can act as an impetus to anchor in pleasure. Especially if you see, if I do this five or ten years from now, I will be in such an amazing place that you become enticed to be in that place. That's what excites you. And then because that excites you, you get excited about doing what's going to get you there. Does that make sense? If you can get excited about a goal, you can get excited about an activity which maybe is not exciting, but now it becomes exciting because the goal is exciting. So the activity now becomes exciting because of what you want. Like when you were studying guitar, it may not have been exciting to practice, but you kept in mind the result. If I practice, then I'm going to be playing like this guy. And if I can play like that guy, that's going to be amazing, and that's what I want. So then the practice all of a sudden is not so bad anymore. Isn't it something like that? But if you didn't have that vision, you're just practicing. It's like, what's the point? You know, teach me something to play. No, you got to play skills. You've got to practice these chords. No, I want to play a song. No, no, no. If you practice like this, you're going to play like this guy. If you just want to play songs now, you play like everybody else. Oh, okay, okay. So now you've got the vision. And then now, now you're inspired to practice these scales. Whereas before, it was just boring. 16 rounds, I can get love of Krishna. If I remember that, that's pretty exciting. People say, I'm bored when I chant. The very thing that's awakening your relationship with Krishna is boring. It doesn't make sense. Does that make sense? This is the mantra that's going to awaken your relationship with Krishna. This is the mantra that's going to enable you to see Krishna, and it's boring. It doesn't make any sense. That's why we have to put things in perspective. 
in terms of results. What's the result of this austerity? If I do this austerity and I get this result, this austerity it becomes attractive. I start to like it because I like what it's going to give me. Just like people work hard at jobs they don't like. And we probably all think, well, if you don't like your job, why don't you quit? No, but they like, they like the money. This job pays money. And with money, I have a nice house, I have a nice car, I've got a big television, I have nice clothes, I have the things that I want. So I'm willing to work that job, and it's not, even, I don't, even though I don't like it, it's not so bad because what I get from it. There was a lady who didn't like her job. So this coach was trying to help her. And, and he said, do you like your house? She said, yeah. Do you like your car? Yeah. Do you like your clothes? Yeah. Do you like the food you eat? Yeah. Do you like the fact that you have health insurance? Yeah. He went down the list and he said, and where do you get all that from? My job. Do you like your job? Yeah, I like my job. So he, he just had to switch around her perspective. She hated the job until she realized that everything that she liked, she got from her job and all of a sudden the job was looking better. Right? Isn't that interesting? So now, when you go home, tonight, tomorrow, someday, think of something that you should do that you're not doing, or you're not doing well enough or enough of. And see if you can associate positive emotions, positive ideas, with that. To a point, when you think about it, you start to feel good about it. Like it feels really good to do that, or it feels really good to avoid this. And if you can, and if you can anchor in those positive feelings, then you'll see it's so easy to do it. Because what was my point earlier? that generally we act based on how we feel, not what we know is right. You agree? It's, it's rare people that can just act on what they know is right without feeling. <coughs> now let's try to guess what country is she from? Is that an Asian? The country those devotees are from? Because every culture has a different. Talk fast, talk slow, talk loud, talk soft. That was loud and fast, right? Is that Asian? Loud and fast? No. Japanese? I don't know. So. Now, does anyone have any questions? Aura Gross, where am I? Three guesses. You guess where I am. It starts with an M and ends with an A. <laughs> and it's in India. <laughs> and we're building a big temple here. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah. When, when I say feel, Feeling, when you feel something, you actually have a physical sensation. If you, if you feel good about something, you say, I feel really good. What does it mean to feel good? There's a physical sensation. Like if I say, Prabhu's, I didn't, I didn't want, I want to surprise you and I didn't tell you, we're having a feast tonight. We have paneer sabji and tomato sauce with peas. We have deep fried potato, cauliflower, sabji with sour cream. We have puris from whole wheat, freshly ground whole wheat flour. We have govinda bob rice with cashews and extra amounts of ghee. We have pakoras made from Eggplant, tomatoes, with a slice of paneer in the middle. Really good. We have halava with blueberries and caramel topping. How do you feel right now? 
Feeling good? <laughs> Excited. <coughs> when you want to do something, when it's positive, you feel, you feel it. Okay, let's do it. Let's have a little fun. Because I think it's okay to have fun in Krishna consciousness if it's not sinful. Is that true? Will I get fired by the GBC if we have fun? As long as it's not sinful, I think we're okay. Think of something that inspires you or think of something that makes you happy. Maybe it's, you know, whatever. Your spiritual master, Vrindavan, caramel-covered halava, your child, your mother, or something you've never done that you'd like to do that might make you inspired. Even if it's not Krishna consciousness, just think of something right, that inspires you. And as you're thinking of it, uh, try to see how you feel physically, if you feel anything. There's some energy in your body or something, or just a good feeling. Some energy, some excitement. Yes, something, something positive. Some, okay, now think of something you'd never ever want to do. And your guru just asked you to do it. And meditate on that feeling. The last thing in the world you'd want to do, and your guru said, you have to do it in five minutes. Could be like chant 192 rounds and don't sleep. Um, you're giving class on Gorpurnima to 3,000 devotees. And you're going to be leading Kirtan and Kirtan Mela. You're, I'm putting you on austerity 64 rounds a day, eating once a day for the next month. You know, something, well, I don't know. But something that is just you wouldn't want to do. And notice how you feel. How do you feel? Is all the energy left here? Yeah, pretty much. There's no energy. <laughs> so it was physical? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's the point. So now, if you could associate the feelings you had for the positive with what your spiritual master asked you to do, then it would be very easy to do. And if you can't do that, and you're trying to do it, it's going to be difficult, or, you, or you'll just fail. You won't be able to do it. So... There's a couple of lessons. One lesson is, obviously, we should be doing things that inspire us because there'll be those positive emotions. But this class is about vows. So vows are not something we, we can choose. These are given to us. This is what you follow. So if you have any negative connotation towards any kind of commitment that you've made, if you can make that connotation positive, it's very easy. But as long as it's negative, you're going you're gonna to have an extremely difficult time doing it. And it, it's unlikely you can do it your whole life if you have negative connotations because there's no energy to do it. There's no emotion behind it. There's no feeling. The feeling is, I don't want to do it. And because we tend to act on feeling, that's the problem. So if we can associate something positive, then it brings us to Satvagun, where what we should do now has a positive connotation. Yes, I'm going to do it. Yes. This is what I should do? Yes, let's do it. That's where we want to be. So we somehow we have to bring ourselves to that. And then it's easy. If it doesn't come naturally. And then someday, everything in Krishna consciousness, yes, you want to do whatever it is. Okay, Prabhu's tomorrow. We're going on Harinam Sankirtan for eight hours in Calcutta. Three hour drive there, eight hours on the street, three hours back. And you're all going. Your Guru Maharaj, he told me you're all going. Okay. So if there's a negative, what do you have to do? You have to start thinking, this is going to be an amazing day, chanting eight hours. I haven't done that in 25 years. And we'll have kirtan on the bus with all the Vaishnavas, association. I'm always home alone. I never have that association. And the people in Calcutta are just going to be amazed because there's so many of us. And then maybe I can distribute some books, get some mercy. So you're going through all these things. And all of a sudden, there's this positive connotation. 
when um, when we were doing Japa Japa workshops, or when we do Japa workshops, then usually we do at least one day of 64 rounds, sometimes more, depending how long the workshop is. And some devotees have never done 64 rounds. So I would sense that for some of those devotees who have difficulty just finishing 16, then the project coming up tomorrow of 64 is putting them in anxiety and they're concerned if they can do it. So I asked them, how many of you are feeling anxiety about 64 rounds? And there's always somebody. Not somebody, there's always a good number of people that will raise their hand. So, so then I say, well, let's reframe it. Could you imagine spending eight hours with Krishna? Would that be good? If you think, oh no, tomorrow I have to spend eight hours with Krishna. I was, I was hoping to surf the internet. You know. Bummer. No, you wouldn't say that. I hope you wouldn't say that. If I said, Krishna's coming tomorrow to spend eight hours with you, he's going to go on a walk with you or whatever you want to do, you'd probably say, oh my God, are you serious? That's like the best thing I ever heard. So I said, reframe Japa as spending eight hours with Krishna. You're going to get to spend the whole day with Krishna. Isn't that amazing? And people started thinking, yeah, that is amazing. And... And I said, go to bed with positive connotations, that this is going to be an incredibly amazing experience. So there was one devotee who was in that group of, I don't know if I can do this. I've never done it. It's going to be difficult. And so we take a vow of silence. We have one class for an hour. And then we have till 6 o'clock to chant. So if you, let's say you start at 5, if you go 5 to 7, you have 2 hours, then class and breakfast, then let's say 10 o'clock, you have, so you have 10 hours. So in 10 hours, if you do 16 rounds in 2 hours, so in 10 hours, you can do like 80 rounds or so. 90 rounds, 80 rounds. You can do about 80. You can, you know, there, and if you squeeze your, your meal times in, anyway, you can, you can do even more. You can, you can get up in the 80s. So this one devotee who was fearful, you know, I tried to help him and the others go into it in a positive way. Then he told me the next day, that it was such a positive experience that when he hit 64, he didn't want to stop, and he got up to like 83. And then, then we had to stop, and we did an exercise of, of just kind of sharing our realizations about the day. So he was so amazed at the experience. So that's an example of what can happen if you have positive connotations towards something. And every time we have negatives about something that we need to be doing, then we work against ourselves. <coughs> That's not, I mean, you might have a negative about something you shouldn't do. That's different, or you don't have to do. But if it's something that's good and you have a negative for it, you have to switch it around and create a positive. What, how could I make it positive? So you think of anything that you should be doing that you have a negative and think how to make it positive to the, to a, the point that when you think about it, you actually feel inspired, you feel energized. Then it'll be easy. Na it'll be natural. It'll be automatic. Like through all these Japa workshops that I've had, I developed this amazing, amazingly positive connotation towards Japa. That Japa is just like, for me, it's like, wow, it's like licking candy or something. You know, it's like, yeah, just you know, chanting. It's like, you know, and, but I know so many devotees don't have that. But through all the work of studying the glories of the Holy Name, it created such a positive impression. And the positive impression created a positive experience. And the positive experience created a positive impression. The positive impression created positive experience. Positive experience created... But it works the other way. The negative impression creates negative experience. The negative experience creates negative impression. The negative impression creates negative experience. Isn't it true? Yeah. So, so that's the importance.
creating the positive impression because then you get the positive experience, which reinforces the positive expression. And so then it just goes up. Now, you might say, well, isn't that going to happen anyway as I advance? It will, but unless we do it this way, we're slowing down the process. Because if we're negative about something that's actually positive, it's harder to get the goal. It's harder to achieve that position where we actually want to do it naturally. So this is kind of, it's reframing our consciousness. Which again is what I said, that's what Prabhupada's doing. He's reframing our consciousness to be positive about what's right. And negative about what we should be avoiding. Is that okay? All right. We have some questions out there. I will answer your questions. Uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> and he said, I yeah, you're in my part. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were still here because I got your email about Alachua and I thought, well, maybe you went back there. Um, Vaishnav Academy, every Saturday, Sunday night, we're here on the top floor or the third floor. And then tomorrow in the Grihasta Park near Smith's at 2.45, we do a class on Bhava outside. So I do that every Monday, every Friday, Saturday here. <clears throat> so, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, oh, my TT answered, okay. Bhagadatta has a question. Thank you so much. How can we reverse being attached to feeling positive about emotions? Something which is negative, for example. I like to be ill because when I'm healthy, <laughs> people take advantage of me. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Don't let people take advantage of you. I think it's the same process as I described. That's where intelligence comes in. Because intelligence analyzes everything, sorts it out, it makes sense out of it. Emotions don't make sense out of things. Emotions just, I mean, they can, but they don't always. It depends on your consciousness. So emotions may make sense and they may not make sense depending on the intensity. So you, if you use your intelligence to analyze the, what you're going to get yourself ill so people don't bother you, that doesn't make sense. And you could be serving Krishna, but you got yourself sick. Yeah. And you, if people are taking advantage of you, you can set some boundaries in your life. You can talk to them and say, you know, don't expect these things of me, etc. That's a, a better approach, isn't it? When you break your vows, you lost your integrity, how is the best way to remedy that fact? I would say there are three things. Backstep and find out where the mistake, where you took that step off the track that caused the problem so you never take it again. So you backtrack it, and then you learn, and then you solidify that you'll never take it. You feel remorseful, because remorse will energize you to never do it again and go forward. And then the third thing is the best apology or the best remedial measure is to act properly. Like what's a better apology than not doing it again? So the best apology is the right action. That's how you remedy. Okay, now I made a mistake. I took a left turn. I should have gone straight, but I took a left turn. And because I took a left turn, I ended up on this road. Because I, wanted, I was on this road, A, B, and C happened. If I hadn't turned left, it wouldn't have happened. So I need to always remember to go straight. So I backtracked my steps and said, what was that first mistake I made that led to a series of other effects and causes? So if I didn't make that mistake, so you can, whenever you see a, a breaking of a principle, you can find a point where you did something wrong that led to causes that wouldn't have been there if you hadn't made that mistake. So then you're aware to prevent myself from making that mistake. 
Yeah. Uh, the, the job analogy, the psychiatrist mm-hmm. talked the woman into believing the, the products of her job. Yes. Yeah. You know, that she enjoyed, but therefore she said, all right, the job is good. Yeah. But he, he, she still finds aspects of the job. She doesn't like the travel, the people at the job, the physicality of the job, who knows, whatever. The other things you mentioned are results, which she enjoys, but she still doesn't, even after yeah. even getting convinced the job is the cause of the, the things she's enjoying, she still doesn't like it. I was, um, I have a story, maybe that'll help. There was a question, but then I just... What? There was a question coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, ask the question. Well, the question would be then that would manifest at some point down the track. Satria, trying to just force himself to break his beyond the nations. It, it may and it may not. Well, I guess there's a couple ways of looking at it. What you say can be true in many cases if the person has an option, but let's say she didn't have an option for another job. So then I would say in that situation, what he got her to do was appreciate that this is the austerity you have to go through to get the things you want, so then it doesn't look so austere anymore. You know, it's like, have you ever got a massage? And then they hit that point, it's like, ah! And the massage person says, just let me massage it because the pain's gonna go away. The more you feel it, so all of a sudden the pain starts feeling good because the pain is curing it, you know? But otherwise, it's just pain, I, I can't stand pain. So it's like, so the people who are at pain at work could be tolerated now with a new attitude that this work is bringing me everything I want. Also, you know, any other job I get is going to have other people who are at pain most likely. And so short of changing my occupation and getting in a really good company, which is an alternative, but if she didn't have that, then, then it makes sense. So... It's different for different people. Um, but I think, I think for us it's similar. Let's say you're going on book distribution and, and it's austere, but at the end of the day you come back and you're very blissful. And so you're thinking, I'm approaching these people, they don't appreciate it. But I know from experience, by the end of the day I feel amazingly purified. So then you end up liking it even though you don't like it. I don't like to talk to people, I'm an introvert, etc. But you end up liking it because of the result. And so it's like a, you love it and you hate it at the same time. There's a lot of devotees like that. They, they don't like book distribution, but they love it. They hate it, but they love it. You know what I mean? Anyone have that experience, book distribution? It's like sometimes it's so hard, but it's so purifying that that you got both emotions going on. Yes. So within devotional life, getting a good attachment to the holy name is purifying. We've had that experience. My experience personally is if I get up at 3 a.m. trying really hard for days and weeks, I, I sort of collapse during the day energy wise, but I do feel like this mixed feeling on books used to be. Yeah. I feel the purification because I'm not so used to it. Born in the darkness of ignorance, living in that atmosphere, being very passionate person, um, that the purification is almost too much. Yeah. It fatigues me. That, that, and, and I actually, <laughs> actually collapse in tiredness. And, I, and I'm like, you know, my wife sees it, that you tried, but you failed, but you, you, what are you doing? You're going to continue. And I just kind of find it almost too, too, too purifying. Yeah, that could be true. I don't know if you've heard what he said. He said that sometimes he gets up so early and it's so ecstatic, but physically he can't maintain it. And, and also mentally, also? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, sti- I still would say what I spoke about should still be done, but then you may have to just, you know, balance it a little bit to something you can maintain more naturally. Because you have two things. You have one, which is positive association, and you have one, which is natural or actual taste. So through positive association, we'll do it better, and that will awaken the taste. And um, in any kind of vow you make, you obviously want to do something you can maintain. So 
um, and it should be natural. So I, I have the same experience. I love to get up early, and a few weeks ago, uh, I never slept more than four and a half, five hours, four hours. And uh, after about a week, my body, I, I was full of mucus. I never had so much mucus in my life. It was like I was a muc I became a mucus factory. If I could sell mucus for a hundred dollars an ounce, I would have been rich. So, so I went to Bangalore after I went to. I, I came down with this on a Friday, and a week later on Friday I went to Bangalore, and I still had it. And on the airplane, for three hours after I got off the airplane, I felt like I was underwater. I had so much mucus. I'd never flown with that much mucus before. And I thought I actually lost my hearing. So we got in in the afternoon, and we had a program in the evening, and I said, take me to an Ayurvedic doctor. In the neighborhood I was living, Every three blocks, there's an Ayurvedic doctor, and there was one actually a block away. So I told him what the symptom was, and then he said, you need massage, you need three massage. How long are you going to be here? I said, five days. He goes, you need three massages. And then another devotee was with me. He said, what about medicine? No, he says, he doesn't need medicine. He just needs massage. He says, why? He said, I told him the symptoms. He said, the symptoms are he is not getting enough rest, and he's been under stress. So during that time period, we were working on developing a website. And I had to write, basically I had to write a book in like a week, you know, to fill the website up. And it was just, you know, getting devotees to work with me and all the time devotees were coming and we were working late and things were going wrong. So, you know, I was stressed, not stressed, stressed, like, but I was somewhat stressed. And I was so energized to finish it, I could never go to bed before like, 12 o'clock, sometimes 1 o'clock, and then I'd get up for the morning walk and make sure I was there on time, and I'd go walking. And then my body went, poop! <laughs> it, co it just collapsed. My wife's saying, you know, you should sleep more. And I didn't take any extra rest during the day. I wasn't tired. It's was like I couldn't sleep. I would just have to finish this project. So then my body collapsed. So I have this experience. And my experience is, According to my body and according to my level of consciousness, there's a certain amount of sleep I need. So if I don't get it, the body will get it back somehow. It'll either just, I'll either just fall asleep somewhere, you know, sit down and fall asleep to catch up, or I'll just get sick and then get enough rest to catch up. So that's part of the, you know, balance. But um, I think the general principle is good if you can balance it, you know, that you like to get up early. I like to get up early, but I don't always get up as early as I like to for that reason. But sometimes I just wake up early and there's no negative. It's like, yeah, it's early, get up. You know, especially when the weather's warm, I tend to get up early because there's no blankets. <laughs> it's not like I'm really in bed. It's just kind of like it's like I took a nap or something. So, yeah. Let's see, we had something else. I didn't make a good impression in a teenager for chanting their rounds. Um, there was once, um, imagine you're eating something and while you're eating it, you're saying, oh my God, this is delicious. I've never had anything this good before. And you're, you're making faces like, hmm. Mm, it's so good. I don't want to act it out, but I could. But you understand. You're know, just like, oh my God, this is so good. But then everybody's, what is it? I want to get some. Isn't it? <laughs> what is it? Where? Do you have more of that? <clears throat> Let me try it. So she's asking, how do you get kids to chant? Well, <clears throat> if you're on the telephone while you're chanting, if you're on the internet while you're chanting, if you're dozing off while you're chanting, that's not going to inspire children. And if you know anything about raising children, you know that most of what is going on in their life, they're learning from you. Not what you say, but what you're doing. And they pick it up. And most, Some psychologists say by five or three, they've already picked it up. And just for example, if you 
let's say you accidentally ran into a car, parked car, and you just drove off. You didn't. Then you call the insurance agency and said, my car is parked and someone ran into it. And your kid heard you do that, say that. <coughs> what would your kid think? think? Well, that's what you do. You need money, you just lie, right? You did, and you can tell them, don't lie, be honest, but they just saw you do something dishonest. That makes a greater impression. So at least, number one, you should be chanting nicely and relishing it, because that'll send a message that chanting is nice. Or, or reading. Generally, kids who read a lot are, are raised in homes where parents are always reading books. That's, you know, kids who are raised in homes where everybody's watching television generally are not the ones who read. There are exceptions. But if your parents are always reading, likely you read, isn't it? So, you know, whatever you want your kids to do, at least do it. It may not always be the solution, but it's, if you try to force them, the risk you run is that when they're older and they're on their own, they'll stop chanting because they didn't like it because you just forced them and you didn't inspire them. So when you force and don't inspire, you run the risk that once they're older, they'll stop doing it because you never gave them a taste for it. So somehow you can give a taste, that's, that's important. Isn't it? That's, that's by example or by words of inspiration. Wow, this tastes so good, oh my God. Have you tasted this before? Oh, this holy name is amazing. I had these amazing, you know, like sometimes I'll tell my daughter, oh, I was chanting Japa, I had these realizations. So that, what does it send? She, what kind of message it sends? She may not be interested in the realization, but it sends a message when you chant, you have realization. Like something goes on when you chant. You know, you're always chanting, you're finishing around, you like it, you're relishing it. Like that. Yes? But if you're schnick schnicking in front of the computer, it sends another message that you don't like to chant, and that chanting is, it's okay to chant that way. And if you get initiated, then you can schnick in front of the computer also. Isn't it? Send this, that's the message. So. Okay. What if we need help in order to develop positive emotions about positive things because we feel weak to do it on our own? Then where can we find help to change our disposition? It depends it depends how much help you need. You can get help from association of devotees, or if it's, a, if it's really a deep problem you have that's uh, psychological or emotional, you may need help from a devotee who's a professional in that area who can, because it may be something deeply rooted that you need help with. But um, the thing you have to understand, this is like, you know, it's so amazing that so many things Krishna says, even in the Gita that are so basic, we don't understand. Like, devotees are all about, my mind is out of control. It's like a given. When you try to control it, it goes out of control. But it's not so much the mind that out, that's out of control, it's where we place our attention. So, if you were saying here, we need help in order to develop positive emotions, it's really not so much developing positive emotions, it's what you're focusing on. If you don't have positive feelings about japa, focus on, give your attention to the positive things about japa, focus on the positive. So, a lot of the problems that we're experiencing is just what we're allowing ourselves to focus on, isn't it? Focusing on positive or negative. So let's say something negative just happened today. So now, the whole day you're focused on it, right? You don't have to. You could focus on the positive. And if you focus on the positive, you have positive experience. If you focus on the negative, you have negative experience. Isn't it? And who's, con who's in control of what you focus on? You are. So, just, just try to look at, it, look at it from the perspective that you have more control than you probably think you do. You have more control of your attention and a lot of your negativity is just coming from the fact that you're focusing on negative things. And how can you be positive if you focus on, neg if you focus on negative? 
Such a simple thing, isn't it? It's so simple that nobody gets it. Yes? It seems like um, we condition ourselves that way for a long time. Yeah. And Maybe when lifetimes. You that time, yeah. It's not so easy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it's true. We're conditioned and it's not so easy. But at least if we understand that the conditioning is pulling us a certain way, but we could, we could, if we want, focus differently if we understand what's going on with the conditioning. Okay, this is, so now let, I, I'm thinking this, see, the, the best way to look at it, and this is how I understand it, I'm thinking this way, but the problem with thinking this way is not getting me that way, and that's the way I need to go. So if I really want to go that way, and it's important for me to go that way, then although it's difficult, I can start reconditioning the way I think so that I can get over here. Because as long as I think this other way, I'm always going to end up over here. And I've been over here, like you said, for a long time. And maybe there's some good things over there, but not everything that I want is over there. So when the desire to be over here gets very strong, then you'll find it's a little easier to change that, to change the focus. You know, Let's say you're not good at something, but you need the results you need certain results, and in order to get those results, you need to be at least a little bit good, or you need to have the proper attitudes that maybe you don't naturally have. And so when you think about it enough, then you realize, well, I want to get this, and these are the attitudes I need to get this. So if somehow or other, I'm going to have to develop these attitudes. I'm going to have to develop a liking for those attitudes. I'm going to have to develop a liking for being like this, or thinking like this. And if I don't, then I should just stop thinking about that and making that my goal because I'm not going to get it. I'm just frustrating myself. So, you know, you can take either route. I'll just be satisfied with these results because it's easier. I'll go with my conditioning. But if I want these results, I'm going to have to change something. And, and at least what I see in my life is if I want these results and I don't do the things that are going to get them, I get frustrated. It's very frustrating because I keep getting these other results, but I want these results. So I have, to be, I have to be a little bit of a different person to get these results. The, um, you know, the simple fact that I'm always going to get the same results by thinking the same way and doing the same things. So a lot of these realizations become impetus for changing, even though it's difficult, but you just realize, if I don't, I'm going to die, and I'm not going to achieve this, and this is what I need to achieve. Right, so it's hard, but I think, I think, what's lacking is the impetus. That's what makes it hard, because you know it's, it requires energy to change. But it can be done. I was this this. Um, there's a really interesting idea that I discovered that sometimes you may not have a nature to be a certain way, but in spite of that, you can act even if it's not your nature, but you can act in a different way. Like, okay, you know, like we would do book distribution. So maybe you're an introvert. But if you're an introvert, you can't sell any books. Nobody gives you donations. So for that four, five, six, seven, eight hours, you go out on Sankirtan, you become an extrovert. And then when you get back in the van, you go back to yourself. You're just quiet and you don't talk to anybody. But out there, you know, everybody's looking at you and going, oh my God, he's so bold, that's so weird because normally he's not like that. So we have that experience that we, we could act in ways which aren't our nature because it facilitated certain goals. So that's also important to understand. Okay, maybe I'm like this, but could I act in a way to get this, even if it's not my nature? And sometimes it's true, you can. I'm a fight with your mind or something. Yeah, it might be fake it and you'll never make it, but at least you fake it and you may never become that way because it's not your nature but in this circumstance you need to act this way you know I'm not a bold person but if I don't become a little bold, more bold or more fearless I'm not going to achieve the result I need so for the service of my guru I act that way and a Prabhupada says in the Gita you know act bold and fearless so okay I'll do that that gets me where I want to be it's not, it doesn't come naturally and so it may, it may never be that I'm like that but at least now I can act that way 
And, you know, in some cases, you will become fearless by acting fearlessly. But in other cases, you may, it may be your nature that you're... You know, I, I, um, I was on the airplane and I... There was a documentary on, I think, climbing to um, Mount Everest. You know, people risk their lives. And then after they did that documentary, they showed other things that people did that, where they risked their lives, you know, like riding a bike between two cliffs, you know, you go down and... And if you land a little short, you, you know, you go down like a, a mile and, you know, you probably wouldn't want to live through that. Better you just die. And it's said that those kind of people have a certain kind of DNA, that they have to do those things. And they're not scary for them. That's just how they are. So that would mean some people are not that way. But the people who aren't that way sometimes have to act that way to accomplish something. And they may never be that way um, completely as much as those people, because it may be biological to some degree. You know people like that? You know? They'll like go out and, you know, surf 20 foot waves that are breaking in like this much water over coral, and if they fall off, they're gonna get their head banged on the coral, but they'll do it. It's called Bonsai Pipeline in Hawaii. And there's a few other places like that, where people body surf these huge waves, and the waves are breaking in like this much water. And if you're not careful, they just get thrown and you like break your neck. But it's kind of like they have to do it. And if they break their neck, it's like, yeah, whatever. Isn't it? You know people like that? Well, they say the lost Clark Jones surfer who goes 250 miles off the Western Australian southwest coast out towards the Antarctic or the, the continental shelf. Uh, wow. He's on the edge of the continental shelf to the Antarctic. 75 foot ocean waves coming across that shelf. So he's 200 miles out to sea. Amazing. He's on 75 foot waves. He could be drowned like a yeah. wasp in a flock pile. You know, um, <clears throat> when they interview people who climb Mount Everest, because you're risking your life, you could die doing it. They said, why did you do it? And they said, because the mountain was there. It's just like, it's there, I have to conquer it. So that's a certain nature that people have. So certainly we can become better than we are, but we may never have that nature. But we can act that way. That's the, that's the amazing thing, that we can change our actions. So if you, if you are looking to achieve something that you're not achieving, then you just look at your, are my actions producing it? And if not... What do I have to change internally to perform the actions that will produce it? Or how can I get myself to produce those actions? It's really actually simple. When you see you're not getting something, it's just, you know, like, maybe your health isn't good. Well, you don't eat right, you don't exercise right. There's always, this is cause and effect. And so you, a lot of people want to achieve something, but they don't believe they can do it. So they're, they don't have, they're not lined up internally with what they want to achieve externally. So they work against themselves. And sometimes people who think that way, they work very hard to achieve it, but internally they doubt themselves, so they never succeed, even though they're working hard. So it's not just the hard work. It's the internal, right? Like Arjuna, it's like, he's a great fighter. So he didn't lack skills, but he couldn't fight. He had a breakdown. So if you lose confidence, but you have skills, then you, you, you won't succeed. Does that make sense? There's one question here. How to improve the quality of chanting and be more focused. Um, go to my website and you can scroll down and there's a banner that says Japa. And um, it's all the Japa workshops and lectures I've given. So it's, it's more than you need, I think. It's much more than you need. Ultimately, the goal has to be... Mahatmadas.com. Mahatmadas.com. Yeah. Well, you also have Krishna's help. So that's there. But at least if you line up the processes that will get you to the goal, or like if I do this, it means I'll achieve the goal. It looks like on paper that this is what's necessary. And then with Krishna's mercy, it will happen. So that, that's the idea. But, but a lot of what we don't look at is the internal. Like what's going on internally that could be blocking me. 
Blocking. Um, I don't think I'm the kind of person that could achieve that. I don't see myself in that position, that level of success. Or if I were successful, that people would expect more of me and I don't, don't want to be in that position. There could be things that are preventing us from achieving it that where we would back off when we get close to it out of fear. So we have to be able to isolate those things. Talk to me. <laughs> you isolate those things and then you look at, okay, what would be the opposite of that? So this is, you know, one of the things you can do when you isolate, you see, if you isolate a fear, let's say you have a fear, we take one of these fears, if I were successful, then, then people would demand more of me. And if people demand more of me, then I would be, I wouldn't be able to deal with it, or I would be very uncomfortable, or I'd be very much in anxiety. So then you have to deal with that reality. Is that actually true? What would you tell somebody who felt that way? So if I told, if that was your fear, and I told you, this is my fear, what would you tell me? And then by explaining it as if it were another person's fear, you, you'll start to see how illusory fears are. They're not in touch with reality. It's not, you know, like your whole world's, world's not going to crumple when you become successful. And the whole world's not going to demand that standard of you to become successful. You know, and whatever success you get, how many people it helps, even if you can't repeat it, at least it helped a lot of people. So you start talking about it and you see that these fears are usually not grounded in anything but a story that I've made up, uh, that I'm imagining it'll be a certain way. And that way you can help yourself. And then, then you can say, well, what would be the good? I'm looking at the bad. Well, what would be the good if I do that? What benefits would there be? So that you go back into the negatives and positives. So you kind of sometimes have to just talk yourself around it. Would Prabhupada be pleased if I did that? And if he'd be pleased, then I'm going to do it. That's a strong motive, right? Okay, we can finish. Thank you for coming. If you want to come tomorrow at 2.45, we'll be in the park. If you want to go for a walk tomorrow morning, then 5.20. Outside Panchatattva. And then we go Tarnpur Road. We go up to Jalungi, come down around the Grihast area into Prabhupada Samadhi. About 6.15 or 6.30, we end up in the Samadhi. And we walk fast, get some exercise also, stay warm. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Go Premanandi Hari Hari Lord.